Okay, so today we'll uh, do linear programming. And I'm sure many of you would have uh, dealt with it in your undergraduate, the simplex algorithm. But uh, we won't be doing any of the simplex algorithms. I'll just give you an overview of uh, linear programming in just one lecture. Okay, so this is the canonical form of linear programming. Minimize with respect to X. C transpose X subject to AX is greater than or equal to B and X is greater than or equal to zero. So the primal, there are N primal variables, um, X, I, and each of them has to be greater than or equal to zero, I equals one through N. And we have M constraints. So every row of uh, the left-hand side and right-hand side will be of this form. Uh, uh, the Jth row will, uh, excuse me, the Ith row would be of uh, this AX greater than or equal to B would be of this form summation j equals one through n, a i j x j greater than equal to b i. And i is from one through m. So we have m dimensional constraint here. b is m dimensional. So x and c are n by one vectors so that this is a scalar, c transpose x and b is a uh, m by one vector and a is a m by and matrix. Now, the feasible polytope uh, is uh, basically the uh, feasible region of uh, the uh, constraint optimization problem. And uh, it's bounded by these equalities, summation AIJXJ equals BJ and XI greater than or equal to zero. So this is what the feasible polytope looks like. Um, this is the feasible region and everything outside this, the gray shaded region is infeasible. These are the uh, constraints on one side, on the white side, each constraint is um, satisfied. And on the other side, in the gray side, the constraint is not satisfied. So this is the feasible polytope. And uh, since we have all X I's are greater than or equal to zero, that, that's why we are confined to the first quadrant here. So none of the variables, so let's, the, in this case, we're looking at just two variables, X1 and X2. So neither of them can be negative. So we are confined to the first quadrant only. And in general, to so the first orthogonal. Now, the number of corners like this uh, of the feasible polytope is uh, m choose m because at each corner there must be n active constraints and since there are m constraints uh, altogether actually in this case i'm including uh, the uh, x type greater than z equal to zero constraints those constraints too i'm including that's why m is greater than m Okay, so uh, the number of corners is M choose N, which is, uh, so we pick um, M out of N. Uh, sorry, this is N choose M, N choose M, uh, which is, uh, I have to work on this uh, expression, it'll be there in the lecture notes. And so uh, each corner has, um, M active constraints and uh, the rest in active constraints. And so uh, there are this many ways to, uh, we can pick N active constraints. And so this is a very large number, okay? When M and N are large, then the number of possible corners are very high. And it just so happens that the solution, if it exists is uh, a unique, it's unique and it's one of the corners of the polytope. It cannot be in the interior of this polytope because uh, this is linear, right? Um, and the, um, 
it's linear programming. So the um, objective function is linear. So these are contours of C transpose X. Okay, and we can only keep increasing in one direction until we hit one of these corners. So it cannot be on, a, on uh, anywhere else apart from uh, one of these corners of the polytope. Here's a degenerate case. In this case, the solution approaches infinity. It's unbounded. So it's not this feasible region is unbounded. It goes towards infinity. And in the opposite case, we have no solutions. None of the solutions can satisfy, no X can possibly satisfy all the uh, feasible uh, conditions. Now, constraint reformulation. Suppose we have an equality constraint of this form, A transpose X equals B. See, in the original, in the canonical form, what we have is these are all greater than equal to con uh, conditions, right? Now, suppose we have something like this. A transpose X equals B. We have suppose such a uh, simple condition, uh, equality uh, constraint. Then how to de convert this into the canonical form? There are two approaches. So this is equivalent to, in terms of scalar, summation AJ XJ equals BJ. So the two approaches are, one approach is, is we take this and then solve for some xj. That's called variable elimination. So we pick any xj whose coefficient aj is not zero, and then we express xj in terms of all the other variables. And then what happens is we replace xj everywhere else in the linear programming, all the other inequality constraints, as well in, as in the objective function with this. So xj is now replaced with this everywhere, and you don't need this um, equality constraint anymore. So eliminate xj from all other constraints and the objective function. That's one approach. The, approach, the other approach is to split this equality constraint into two inequality constraints. A x, sorry, A transpose x equals B can be replaced with A transpose x is less than equal to B and A transpose x is greater than equal to B. So basically you are doubling uh, the equality constraints, okay? So this is another way to deal with equality constraints. Now, by the way, uh, there is also another form of uh, the uh, linear programming called the standard form where we have only equality constraints, okay? So <coughs> inequality constraints can also be converted to equality constraints, just so that you know. Suppose we have something like this, A transpose X is less than equal to B. Uh, inequality constraint. Then what we can do is we can introduce this new variable called a slack variable XS. Okay, and this A transpose X is less than equal to B can be replaced with A transpose X plus XS equals B with XS greater than equal to zero. And XS is known as a slack any questions so far? Now, suppose we have an unrestricted variable. Now here uh, in the original uh, canonical form, all the components of X, each XI has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's why we are confining ourselves to the first quadrant. Now, suppose you have an unbounded variable that doesn't have to be positive. Xi. So we have an X. I'm just dropping the index. Uh, so we have an X and it can be negative two. So X can be anywhere between negative infinity and infinity. In this case, what should we do? 
we can replace x with two variables, x a and x b, such that x is x a minus x b, where x a and x b are both greater than or equal to zero. Everywhere in the LP, wherever this x appears, the unrestricted uh, variable appears, you can replace it with x a minus x b. And you can introduce these two uh, new variables too. So this is basically the canonical form of linear programming. Do we have any questions so far? Here's an example application of uh, uh, linear programming. So uh, we have um, a digraph like this, and you see uh, all. You see these are all arrows. Uh, the edges have directions. Okay, um, and uh, each of these nodes. Uh, how many nodes do we have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six nodes, and one of the nodes is designated as the source, and another node is designated as the destination. And these weights attached to these um, arrows are the capacities of those arrows. Okay, so imagine like anything, water or any, anything, whatever, is flowing from the source to the destination. Okay, and so uh, through pipes, and uh, the capacity of this pipe is 1.2, maximum capacity. So the amount of water that can flow from 1 to 2 cannot be more than 1.2. So this is a capacity of this. Um, arrow uh, or directed edge. So we have all these weights are capacities. Okay. And uh, so uh, edge weights are the maximum capacities. The flow cannot exceed this value. Okay. And we have to maximize the total flow from the source to the destination. Okay, now if I'll introduce all the uh, constraints, but assuming that all the constraints are satisfied, then the outflow from source, this source will be along this and this, right? From this and this, and which will be equal to the inflow coming from here and here. Inflow to the, uh, the destination, in this example, destination is six. So the total, uh, flow from three to six plus five to six is the total amount of fluid that is received by our inflow of this destination, which would be equal to the outflow, which is whatever is flowing out from one to two plus whatever is flowing out from one to four. Okay, and so let us um, uh, denote by x sub ij to be the flow from node i to node j. Okay. So how many variables do we have all together? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There will be eight variables because we have eight edges. And so we can either, since I told you when all the constraints are satisfied, the outflow from source is equal to the total inflow to destination. Whence we can either maximize the total outflow or the total inflow. So x12 plus x14 is the total outflow of source one. Correct? This is the source. And that's what we want to maximize. Maximize the flow subject to the following conditions. All the capacities um, constraints must be um, satisfied. So the total flow from one to two, which is X one, two, 
must be less than 1.2 because the capacity of this edge is 1.2. Likewise, what's from, uh, let's say from three to six, three to six, uh, X36 cannot exceed 2.5, correct? So these are the capacity constraints. And we also cannot have the, for, except from the source and destination, the total inflow to any node must equal the total outflow. So consider this, or uh, uh, consider this one. Whatever is coming into two, the total inflow to two is X12 plus X42. So X1 plus X4, uh, X12 plus X42 uh, is the total inflow. Okay, and the total outflow is, it can flow from two to five, but you see that this is bi-directional. So in other words, there, this flow can be in either direction. Okay, so we have outflow uh, having two components, X23 and X24. So X23 and X24, uh, so that's the uh, total uh, outflow. So total inflow should be equal to total outflow. Okay, so these are the flow constraints. Are you guys with me with, uh, as far as this is concerned? Yes. Okay, and we also must have, uh, we cannot have negative flows, right? Because we have arrows, so we cannot have negative flows. Otherwise it would mean water flowing in the opposite direction. And therefore, we must enforce this constraint. All these x's must be greater than or equal to zero. So this is a linear programming problem. This max flow problem has been reduced to a simple a linear programming problem. Okay. Fractional programming. Suppose we have to max, this is our problem. We have to minimize with respect to X, C transpose X plus D, D is a scalar, divided by P transpose X plus Q. And of course, um, this P transpose X plus Q uh, must be greater than zero. That's one of the con con conditions. It cannot be zero, otherwise this whole thing will be infinity and it cannot be negative. Okay, so uh, this is one condition and we have another condition, AX must be greater than equal to B and X must be greater than equal to zero. This is a fractional programming problem. Okay, so we can uh, transform this uh, to a linear programming problem. Here's how by changing the variables and introducing another variable. So now we introduce these variables, a scalar variable Z, which is one over the denominator. Okay. And a vector Y of the same dimension as X, Y equals X over the denominator and since z is one over the denominator, y is simply equal to zx. Okay, and now we can express this objective function to minimize in terms of z and y. This objective function uh, is equal to c trans, uh, uh, transpose y. C, which is C transpose X over denominator, right? This C transpose Y is nothing but C transpose X over the denominator and this plus D, 
z. d divided by the denominator is dz because z is one over the denominator. So this is what we want to minimize now in terms of y and z. And what are our constraints? A x is greater than equal to b. Multiplying both sides with z, we get a y greater than equal to b z. Okay, because if we multiply this side um, uh, with z, we get b z, and this side a z x, z x is y. And then this, what does this second condition reduce to? P transpose x plus q is the denominator greater than equal to zero. It's the same thing as saying that z must be greater than zero, right? Z is simply one over the denominator. So z greater than zero, and we must have y greater than equal to zero. If x is greater than zero, this condition, then y also must be greater than equal to zero because the denominator is always positive. Okay, so this is, sorry, the equivalent LP linear programming problem corresponding to this fractional program. Questions? L1 norm minimization. Suppose this is what we have to do. We have to minimize with respect to x the L1 norm of um, ax minus b. And you know what the L1 norm is of a vector? Just the sum of the absolute values of all the scalar components of the vector, right? So let yi be equal to the ith component of, um, so basically, uh, this is a little awkward notation. And this is simply the ith row of ax minus b and the absolute value of that. It's a scale. Um, it's a little awkward notation, but I hope uh, it doesn't confuse you guys. Are you guys okay with this? Yes. Okay. And so, um, we call the uh, absolute value of the ith component of this vector ax minus b uh, yi. And so uh, since it's an absolute value, it must be greater than equal to zero. Okay. Hence, our L1 norm is equal to the summation of the yi's, which is the same thing as one transpose y. Right? And so, so here's visually what it looks like. So uh, AX, the ith component of AX minus B has to lie in this region, right? And this YI, this is plus YI, and we're trying to tighten. You see the direction we're trying to, by minimizing one transpose YI, we're trying to minimize every component YI, tighten this. So minus yi goes in this direction, plus yi is decreasing, we want to minimize, so it goes in this direction, okay. And we must add this constraint, y is, uh, yi is greater than equal to zero, so we add y is greater than equal to zero. And now, ax minus b must be within this uh, um, region, right? negative y and y, because it's absolute value. If the absolute value is y, component y is absolute value, then if you remove the absolute value, it can be either positive or negative. Therefore, we have negative y is less than equal to ax minus b is less than equal to y. Are you guys with me? Or do you need, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. You can always interrupt me.
No questions, I'm assuming. Um, therefore, this is the ith component of ax minus b, and it has to lie in this region. Okay, and we are trying to tighten this. So we're trying to tighten this so that at the solution, either this or this will be an active constraint, right? Either we have, suppose the ith component is negative, then it, this constraint must be uh, active. So negative y, uh, ax star minus b, the ith component of that, if it's less than zero, that means negative y i star equals the component. On the other hand, if the ith component at x star, the ith component of the vector a, a x star minus b is greater than zero, then plus y i equals the ith component. Okay, so it, it's either this or this because we're try, trying to tighten all the y's so that at the optimum, it'll hit. Okay, and so this is the uh, final um, linear programming problem. Minimize with respect to x and y, one transpose y subject to ax minus b less than equal to y and ax minus b greater than equal to minus y and y is greater than equal to zero. Okay, so this L1 non-minimization problem, unconstrained, can be broken down in this manner into straightforward linear programming. In a similar manner, suppose we have L infinity uh, uh, norm minimization. So we have to, what's the L infinite norm? We take all the scalar components of the vector, take their absolute values, and whichever has the highest magnitude, that is the L infinite norm, correct? So let y equals max of the absolute value of ax minus b, i, the ith component of ax minus b. Okay, so this is what the L infinite norm is, and we want to minimize y. So minimize with respect to x, y, y, and subject to the constraints, ax minus b less than equal to y times one, just as in the previous case, and ax minus b greater than equal to negative y one. And y must be greater than equal to zero. So this L infinity norm, this one, L infinite norm uh, minimization problem has been converted to a simple um, linear programming problem. Okay. Now, so we saw enough applications of linear programming. What's the dual of the linear programming problem? This is the original problem, the primal problem, the primal function is C transpose X. Uh, sorry, the primal problem is uh, this C transpose X subject to AX greater than equal to B and X is greater than equal to zero. Okay, first, what should we do? Uh, when we try to formulate the dual function, the first step is to get the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian LX lambda mu is C transpose X since we have a greater than equal to constraint here, that's why I'm using a negative sign here. Okay, AX minus B is greater than equal to zero is our constraint. That's why I'm using a uh, minus sign here and lambda must be greater than equal to zero, correct? Because this is an inequality constraint. So minus lambda transpose AX minus B and then I'm using negative here too uh, for my own reasons mu transpose x because x must be oh excuse me uh 
mu is also uh, another since x is greater than or equal to zero don't confuse this mu as the dual variable for a equality constraint all the mu's have to be greater than zero too okay because this is another set of inequality constraints am i clear so this is the lagrange multiplies and both lambda and mu are now uh uh dual variables or lagrange multipliers for uh inequality constraints therefore both lambda and mu have to be greater than equal to zero am i clear so far yes it's clear okay now rearranging terms i take terms co uh, containing x uh here so c transpose minus lambda transpose a minus mu transpose of x plus we have minus here minus here so we have plus lambda transpose b okay and now uh what do we do for uh, the dual we have to eliminate the primal right we have to minimize this with respect to the uh, this lagrangian with respect to the primal x and then it becomes a function theta d of lambda n okay so we have to minimize this with respect to x now what's the minimum if any of these is not equal to 0 then we can let um x be the corresponding x be infinity right correct so the minimum is unbounded the minimum of this is a linear function right it's unbounded okay uh, in x except when what's inside parenthesis is zero theta d lambda mu is infimum with respect to x of this lagrangian which is now lambda transpose b is uh, independent of uh, x so we can remove it take it outside so theta d lambda mu is lambda transpose b plus this infimum now if any of these components of this vector is non zero then the infimum is unbounded right so the infimum this component this infimum here will be zero as the lower bound it will always be zero when this is equal to zero so in this vector c transpose minus lambda transpose a minus mu transpose is zero in that case this whole thing will be zero otherwise it will be unbounded minimize pi of x minus 31 you can simply set y equals infinity right and so it's and, and the minimum will be negative infinity correct right? so we have to make sure that the code this here is this row vector here is zero and in that case this whole term disappears and we are left with lambda transpose b therefore this is our theta d lambda mu when this condition is satisfied that is when c transpose minus lambda transpose a equals mu transpose then the minimum this part infimum is zero and so we are left with lambda transpose b otherwise if this condition is not satisfied then we can make this infimum negative infinity and remember lambda and mu must be greater than or equal to zero okay so this is theta d lambda mu this is 
your first example of um, obtaining uh, the dual function. Okay, so this is theta d lambda. And these are the constraints. Now, this is the dual problem. Let's see what the dual problem is. This is the primal problem. This is theta d. Now, in the dual problem, what do we want to do? Do we want to minimize this or maximize this? We have to do the opposite, right? Here we have to, the primal problem involves minimization of, with respect to the primal variable. So the dual function will involve maximization with respect to the dual variables, right? Now, if you want to maximize, why bother about this negative infinity, right? So when we adjust lambda and nu, unless we make sure that this condition is met, okay, if this condition is not met, then what happens? The infimum becomes negative infinity, right? And so when we are trying to maximize with respect to lambda and nu, we must ensure that this constraint is satisfied. Otherwise, it it'll be negative infinite. We are only focusing on the maximum, right? So the maximum will be lambda transpose d when this condition is met. Okay. Did you follow what I said? Mohammed? Yes. Biswiji? Do you understand? What's your question? Women? Everyone understood? I, well, since none of you uh, ask any questions, I'll uh, just proceed further. So this is the dual. And therefore, since we want to maximize with respect to lambda and mu, we impose this condition here. Okay, so we drop the case uh, where theta d is negative infinity, since we are maximizing it. Therefore, we must satisfy this requirement. C transpose minus lambda transpose A should equal mu transpose or taking the transpose of that, uh, C minus A transpose lambda should equal mu. Now, here's a little trick. Mu and lambda are greater than or equal to zero. Okay. We can simply drop mu. And oh, sorry, once, and in which case theta d lambda as long as this constraint is satisfied, theta d lambda mu is simply equal to lambda transpose d. And mu is greater than or equal to zero. So what role is it is this playing mu? It's only this. Its only role is here. So we can simply drop mu by letting, uh, introducing this condition, c minus a transpose lambda must be greater than or equal to zero, right? So we have no need for mu anymore. Now we have to maximize this. This is now uh, the dual uh, problem. We have to maximize with respect to lambda D transpose lambda. We have eliminated mu, so maximize with respect to lambda alone. Uh, and this is our new constraint. C minus A transpose lambda greater than or equal to zero, or A transpose lambda must be less than or equal to C. And we have eliminated mu, no need for the mu. Uh, 
lambda must be equal to the initial velocity. So this is the primal problem, primal form of the same LP, and this is the corresponding dual form. Dr. Das, just a, uh, a small question. Can you please go over again? Why did we drop the mu? Okay, well, suppose, let's pretend mu is there, okay? Theta d lambda mu equals uh, lambda transpose b, which is b transpose lambda. Right. Right? Maximize with respect to lambda and mu. Mm -hmm. And then we would have now this condition is has to be satisfied, right? Mu greater than or equal to zero. Is the, uh, since mu is greater than or equal to zero, we must have this con condition, which is this condition, right? Mm. And we, the other constraints would be lambda greater than or equal to zero, mu greater than or equal to zero. Mu, the only place mu appears will be as uh, mu greater than or equal to zero here. Everywhere else, we, we don't have uh, anything that involves mu. If, so mu would be redundant. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, I'll give you a nice uh, uh, example. Okay, thank you. Okay. We can strong duality. Okay, so now this is the primal problem. This is the secondary problem. And uh, one of the following uh, statements is true. Understand that sometimes this could be unbounded or it could be, uh, what was the other word? Uh, unbounded, uh, the solution could be unbounded or one unbounded or no solution i didn't have a specific term for it sorry so. now if the primal, this is the primal, this is the dual. If the primal is unbounded, then the dual is infeasible. It won't have any solution. If the solution to the primal is X approaches infinity, it's unbounded, then the solution to the dual is uh, lambda does not exist. Dual is infeasible. Okay. On the other hand, if the primal is infeasible, suppose this has no valid solution x, feasible solution x, then the dual becomes unbounded. I don't have the proof for this, but that's true. Okay, it's interesting, right? If this is unbounded, primal is unbounded, then uh, the dual is infeasible and vice versa. So one is unbounded, then the other is infeasible. Now, if the third condition is when both are bounded and feasible, Okay, then x star lambda star exists and not infinity, then strong duality holds C transpose x star will be equal to B transpose lambda star. The minimum of this will touch the maximum of this. Okay. Now, here is an example of how you interpret the dual. Okay, it's a simple example, but it will make things clear. Suppose this is a small uh, linear programming problem. We have x1 and x2 as the two scalar variables, so it's basically two dimensional. Minimize with respect to x1, x2. This is the objective function 9x1 plus 8x2. Subject to these constraints, x1 plus x2 must be greater than or equal to 5. And 
3x1 plus twice x2 must be greater than or equal to 10. Okay, so we want to minimize. So you see 9x1 plus 8x2, but x1 plus x2 must be greater than or equal to 5. 3x1 plus 2x2 must be greater than or equal to 10. These are our constraints. And of course, in addition, x1 and x2 must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, now we can combine constraints to form new constraints. We can combine constraints with positive weights to form new constraints. Okay, for instance, I multiply the first constraint with one and the second constraint with one. Then what do I have? X1, one X1 plus one times three X1. So that's X1 plus three X1, four X1 plus one X2 plus two X2, that's three X2 is greater than or equal to five plus 10, that's 15. If I were to use another set of weights, weight this by two and the second constraint by one, then I'll have two X1 plus three X1, that's five X1. And then twice X2 plus twice X2, that's four X2 greater than or equal to 20. That's another equivalent constraint, right? If I were to weight both of them with two, I'll get this new constraint. This is another constraint. This is another con uh, constraint and so on. So we can have any number of constraints. See this one is, if I weight this one with two and this one with 20, I get 62 X1 plus 50 X2 greater than or equal to 310. The last but one is uh, with weights 10 each, 40 X1 plus 30 X2 is greater than or equal to 150. Okay. Now, these new constraints provide a lower bound of the objective function, 9x1 plus, eight X2. See, here, one of the constraints we obtained, new constraints we obtained was this, four X1 plus three X2 greater than or equal to 15, right? This was a constraint. Now, 9x1 plus 8x2, look at the coefficients of x1. Here it's four, here it's nine. Here it's uh, for x2, the coefficients are three and here it's eight. Now, if four x1 plus three x2, remember x1 and x2 are both greater than uh, equal to zero. They cannot be negative. So if four x1 plus three x2 is greater than equal to 15, can nine x1 plus eight x2 be below 15? Never, right? 9x1 plus 8x2 must always be greater than uh, equal to 4x1 plus 3x2, correct? Given that x1 and x2 are positive? Because x1 and x2 are positive. Okay, so this 15 here is a lower bound. This cannot be lower. The objective function 9x1 plus 8x2 can never be lower than 15. Let's look at this one. Here we have 9x1 plus 8x2. Now the constraint is 9x1 plus 7x2 greater than or equal to 35. Can 9x1 plus 8x2 be below 35 then? Here 9, 9, and here 8x2, here we have 7x2. This 9x1 plus 7x2 must always be less than equal to 9x1 plus 8x2, correct? And since we have this as a constraint, this objective function here can never go below 35. Agreed? Yes. So all of these are lower bounds of the objective function. Different lower bounds of the objective function. Now, 
we also obtain these two inequalities from these two. When we weighted both uh, with 10, 10, we got this, this one. 40x1 plus 30x2 must be greater than or equal to 150. But is this 150 a lower bound? Actually, no. no. Because here you see 9x1, a 40x1 here. 8x2, and here we have 30x2. Right? So what's happening? This will be below this, right? And so this 150 cannot be a lower bound. Okay. Likewise, 62x1 plus 50x2 is greater than or equal to 310, but 310 can never be a lower bound because 62x1 plus 52, sorry, 50x2 is always greater than or equal to 9x1 plus 8x2. So these two are not lower bounds. So which is the tighter lower bound? Since we are trying to minimize the objective function, right? The tighter one is the one, the highest one, 35 in this case, right? Yes. We want to raise the ceiling or we want to raise the floor. So the lower bound is the floor, right? This can never drop below the lower bound. So if we raise the lower bound, we get closer to the actual optimal uh, uh, point. Agreed? Yep. So what we should do is, but we should always ensure that these, so here's what we do. We, let's generalize. So we can, choose any pair of weights, lambda one and lambda two, greater than or equal to zero for the constraint. And then the first constraint we multiply with lambda one, the second constraint we multiply with lambda two. And then we get this constraint, lambda one plus three lambda two times x one plus lambda one plus twice lambda two x two must be greater than or equal to five lambda one plus 10 lambda two. Okay, now this will be a lower bound only if this guy here, this coefficient of x1 must be less than or equal to nine, right? And if the coefficient of x2 must be less than or equal to eight. So the first coefficient, the first coefficient here must be less than or equal to nine. Only then will it be a valid constraint and likewise uh, this, and we must have uh, comparing the coefficients of X2. Here we have Lambda one plus Lambda, sorry, plus twice Lambda two. This must be less than or equal to eight. So these constraints, as long as these constraints are satisfied by la with Lambda one and Lambda two, we can pick, we can make any pre, uh, any new uh, lower bound. Five lambda one plus 10 lambda two will serve as a lower bound of this objective function. Agreed? As long as these pair of constraints are satisfied. Okay, so this will be a five lambda one plus 10 lambda two as a lower bound if just like uh, I said earlier, if these conditions are met. And now we want to raise the floor. Since we want to minimize this, we want to find the tightest lower bound. Okay, so we want to raise the value of this Okay, so the maximum lower bound is this. We want to maximize five lambda one plus 10 lambda two. But these conditions must, must be satisfied. This is a maximization problem. 
Okay, and these conditions must always be satisfied. And furthermore, lambda one and lambda two are greater than or equal to zero. So this gives the new LP problem. Maximize five lambda one plus 10 lambda two, subject to lambda one plus three lambda two being less than or equal to nine, lambda one plus twice lambda two less than or equal to eight. And lambda one and lambda two greater than or equal to zero. This, in fact, is the primal, and this is the dual. Any questions with this? No. Sure? Yep. OK, um, so this is uh, the end of today's lecture, then. Shall we quit? Yes, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Das. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.